Hello, my name is Colin Doyle, and I'm a Senior Systems Engineer at Juniper Networks. This is the fifth video in a series that demonstrates to the viewer how to install, configure, and operate a Juniper SD-WAN spoke test environment on their own laptop or desktop computer. In my previous video, we set up our client testing guest, configured a VLAN to connect to our VSRX secure gateway, and cloned a Python script from a Git repository for web traffic generation. In this video, we'll be onboarding our VSRX into our cloud CSO tenant, checking our SD-WAN licensing, and deploying application signatures. I would also like to say hello to any first-time viewers. The process is outlined here, and in the videos that follow can generally be applied to any CSO lab environment. So if you already have a virtual lab, or if you are testing with SRX Secure Gateway hardware, this is a great place to start. And for those of you who have joined me in building our test environment, congratulations. We're almost done. Let's begin. Before we get too far into this, I want to make sure that everybody's watching that wants to follow along has a valid login to the CSO SD-WAN portal. This goes for internal and external Juniper assets. If you're external, as in not a Juniper employee, and you want to try our SD-WAN solution, please get in touch with your account team or drop me a message in the comments below and I'll figure out who you need to talk to. They can grant you access and then you can build this environment and do some testing. The first step you want to take is to power up your RPI WAN emulator and your VSRX. Well, I've done this already, just to save some time. I'm going to log into the RPI WAN emulator. We built, I think it was in our third video, maybe our second. There we go. And I'm just going to verify that my bridge interfaces are up. I'm looking for a BR0 and a BR1. And I see them here at the top. And in fact, I see IP addresses assigned to them as well. Sometimes these IP addresses might change. Sometimes they might not be here at all. You really just want to make sure the interfaces are up. Uh, where really matters is that your VSRX can reach the internet. So we'll jump over to that VM right now. And we'll make sure that we have IPs. And we're looking specifically at GE000, which will be our WAN0 link, and GE001, which will be our WAN1 link. And you can see here that in one case of one of these interfaces, we have an identical IP address. Actually, no, we don't. Uh, it's just a little transposed here. In any case, this is where it matters. Now, in order to provision this device using ZTP, and we can generate a config and copy it, but ZTP is probably the use case most folks are going to be interested in, uh, there are two things that we need to enable in the configuration. Uh, the first is we need to set up a name server. We'll do that here under the system hierarchy. In fact, both of our changes go here. So do name server. Pick the one of your choice. I'll use the Google server. We also need to configure the phone home service. Now this service is enabled by default on Junos when it's first out of the box or on the virtual machine, uh, but it goes away with the first commit. And we've already done a commit to this box uh, when we moved our interfaces into the trust security zone and did some other odds and ends in the video where we provisioned this. Um, so we do need to read add this. Right rect.juniper.net. What this redirect server does is, oh, <laughs> give me, um, there's a bit I'm missing here. What this redirect server does is it allows us to have a single relay point that everything can call back into. Um, and obviously the configuration is going to have to be the same on every box that goes out. So the redirect server is kind of a clearinghouse for serial numbers that have been registered with any of the services that we offer that allow zero touch provisioning. And this could even go for you know, ISP customers who have their own provisioning servers that they want to redirect to. So this doesn't necessarily redirect into a Juniper system. Uh, it just acts as a relay. And, and this is pretty standard. Once that relay is done, you create a secure communication channel with whatever that destination server is, and you're delivered your configuration. So now that that's done, we want to make sure, again, I think we did this already, maybe not, just that we can ping that DNS server. We'll also ping the redirect server. We won't get a reply, but it will verify that we're getting name resolution. And there we go. So that's fine. That's actually an operational state. So that is all we need to do with the RPI and the VSRX. Right now, what we'll do is we'll jump over to the CSO, we'll get logged in, and actually go through the provisioning process. When connecting to the CSO service, you'll connect to one of two cloud instances. 
The Contrail-Juniper.net instance that you see on the screen right now is an internal Juniper sandbox available to Juniper SEs, other employees, and I believe partners. Our production instance is at cso.juniper.net. Depending on whether you're an internal or external resource, you may have access to one or both. Surely, if you do have a login, you'll know which instance it's for. In terms of usability, if you are logging into cso.juniper.net, what the process is, your workflow here on out, is going to be the same as the one I'm using. Now, because I'm using the internal instance, and because I'm an SE, I actually have a number of tenants I'm connected to. If you're an external resource, likely you only have one and you won't have to make this change. I'm going to be connecting to one of the two tenants that I manage. Once in this tenant, I'm going to click on the button that says Resources here on the left to get to the site management. Here I can see a list of uh, provider hubs and then so they're all provider hubs, even though this one has a naming convention that kind of suggests it's not. Um, provider hubs allow for tunnel instantiation and management, but do not afford any connectivity to LAN networks that might exist behind that hub. Um, kind of from an ISP concept, these would be the, the, the underlay architecture. Uh, we also have enterprise hubs that most customers would probably be using. Enterprise hubs allow you to install physical hardware in a data center or a virtual machine somewhere and connect LAN segments behind that. Now, for the purposes of the testing we're going to do, we're going to be using a provider hub. Well, I want to add an on-premise spoke. You can see I'm going to do that manually. You can also use a template. It's JSON driven. And we have APIs that allow you to load templates in from off box. So pretty flexible, particularly if you're at scale. We have a lot of options for automation. So I'll go ahead and click that. Give it a name. You can make this whatever you like. I'll just call mine BSRX Spoke. I'm going to click SD WAN. We are going to add LAN connections. We don't have to click this button now. It's just a preference of mine. I like to do this after the site is provisioned, but you can do it now. Or you can, you know, if you've already defined LAN uh, services, you can push those existing services out to any new spoke. Put in an address. We don't have to be too specific here. This just has to do with where the pin goes on the map. So I'm just going to put in Portland, Oregon and click validate to see where it looks like on a map. I know that's going to work though. So I'll save myself the time, we'll do a time zone. I've done this enough times to know if I type in LOS, it'll give me Los Angeles. Now, if you are using a production instance or maybe even just any of our internal instances, if it's brand new, you're likely not going to see all these options. Uh, each of these templates represents a different type of deployment method. Um, if you're, a customer and you have a production you know, deployment of this, you're only going to see the templates for the products that you use. So you won't have to pick and choose through here. Uh, we're using uh, virtual SRX and we're doing CSO as a service, CPE, so I'm going to use this one here. Now, the first thing it asks for is a serial number. I have that copied over here so I can put that right in. Um, if you want to get that off of your SRX, you just do a show chassis hardware. You'll see it here at the top. The serial numbers are created kind of uh, somewhat deterministically when you instantiate a, a BSRX instance. So there's a bit of randomization. You're never going to get the same one twice if you reinstall a BSRX. So just uh, make sure that you get this right, because this is how we re register through the redirect server. Um, I have already using the correct image. An auto activate simply saves me a step when I do the deployment, so I don't have to put in an activation code. Our link type is ethernet. We'll leave this on DHCP. You could do static. Uh, if you do decide to do a static address, it can be a little weird to try to figure out exactly what IP address uh, Fusion's using. Uh, in my case, since I already checked, uh, I know that it's, uh, this flies a little bit in the sense of, in the uh, face of convention here, but it's uh, actually dot two on each of these subnets, it's zero dot two. That is the gateway, and dot one dot two. Believe it or not, I figured this out doing a trace route earlier. There is no way to do static assignments for DHCP, but I found these addresses to be sticky over the course of months and months and turning this, these things off and on and off and on. Uh, you might want to do static. In fact, you know what? I'll just show you how it works here. Uh, 10.0.0. Uh, we'll just give it a high number that we know is not in use. 
and 10.0.0.2. And this is kind of where it gets weird. Unless you know exactly what your gateway IP address is, you want to be really careful about this bit of the configuration. Like I said, I did a trace route to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. um, and you can see that first hop is 10.0.0.2. Uh, .0 now the bridging that goes on kind of masks the rest of those results, but I know that's my next hop gateway. So just make sure that you get that correct if you want to do a static IP address. Uh, because what will happen is it'll create a provisioning profile, it'll push it to the device, and if you've got this information wrong, it'll disconnect the device and you'll have to start over. We're also going to enable local breakout. This allows local internet breakout traffic so we don't have to go over the tunnel to the provider hub and breakout there. Uh, we can keep these uh, rules here. We're going to make it the preferred breakout link. Uh, we're not going to use full mesh because we don't have devices. Uh, if you do turn on full mesh, it essentially allows you to apply metadata tags and mesh to together either partially or completely other sites that have the same tags. Uh, connect to hubs, yes. We want to have at least one connection connected to the hubs. We'll have two in our case. And then we'll make this a default link. And I like to make WAN0 the default for both breakout and any other traffic. And I do that because it makes uh, seeing failover a lot clearer. I mean, it's pretty clear when it happens, but you know, if you have no traffic on one link and then you have suddenly traffic on that link, you know that uh, you failed over properly. Four and one two. And I already checked. I know that's going to work. Uh, I changed this to MPLS. Uh, this has to do with matching the interface types that are being presented by your hubs. Um, it's uh, these could both be internet. Uh, I'm just doing one for internet, one for MPLS. They'll operate the same way. Uh, there's some nuance there, but it's not relevant to what we're doing. So we'll enable local breakout. Uh, not make it the default. We'll connect this to the hubs as well. We'll use it for OEM traffic. And that's that. We're not doing a LAN segment, which means we can skip this. and It'll jump through port profile. And here's that JSON template I was telling you about. You can download any config you put together. We also have an example template that you can download that will allow you to build your own uh, site if you like. So at this point, I'll click OK. And this will initiate the provisioning process, which starts with it building the configuration, then detecting the device and bootstrapping it. Now, this process doesn't take a huge amount of time, but it is enough time that I don't want to just go on mute. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the recording, and then we'll come back when this is complete and we'll finish up the video. Like I said, maybe, I don't know, it could take eight minutes maybe, but that whole time this thing's going to be eating up uh, storage on my laptop, so I'll spare it the trouble. All right, see you in a few. And we're back. There's a bit of an air gap. The most astute observers that are watching this will note that the time has changed dramatically in the upper hand, hand quarter. And hey, that screen that was up before isn't up anymore. In fact, if you do watch, it takes about six to eight minutes and eventually everything turns green and says success. And then you click OK and you end up right back here. The reason we're not doing that is because I had to step away from the work for a minute, take a couple calls, and I ended up on a Zoom meeting. and. Well, it's a couple hours later now. So we can see that our VSRX spoke has been onboarded. As long as we see this check mark provisioned and up, we're good to go. So our final steps here are to install any licenses that are required and then push our application signatures. The licensing requirements can differ depending on what you're doing and what your use cases are. Um, if you're in the internal environment versus the production environment, if you're using software or hardware, really this is something you need to coordinate with your account team. For me, since I'm using VSRX, I need to make sure that I have a license that includes a application ID component. Um, I'm going to use our SRX uh, ATP license. And what that means is that'll just basically give me every license feature that I can think of, which includes app ID. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just push that out to my device here. And oh. Need you to push out, please. There we go. Push licenses. Must not have been patient enough. So we're going to wait. And uh, I'll fast forward here because this can take a hot minute. Oh, or it can be done right away. Perfect. All right. Well, now that that license has been installed, I can go down my signature database. And it says it's completed. Perfect. And I have. Uh, the latest database version here, so I can just say install on device, and I can click this checkbox here, and uh, it tries because I didn't have the license to try to do it, and it didn't work, so 
that I can ignore safely. And uh, start this task. We can see that it says the IDP license is valid. And while this is finishing up, this will be the last thing that we do in this video. Uh, the next two videos are probably going to be the most fun, I'd say. Uh, video 6 is going to cover the basic policy creation and will get us connectivity to the internet from our testing client. And then we'll have some practical SLA demonstrations in our final video, which is number 7. So uh, stay tuned. And once this is done, we can say goodbye. In the meantime, I guess I can show you some cool stuff. If you want to verify that your tunnels are up, um, you can log in and do a show security IKESA. This will show you that your OAM and data tunnels are up. It's a kind of a quick and easy way if you want to just log into the device to see if uh, it's been onboarded. If you see some similar output to this, you probably know you're in a good spot. You also notice the host name changed. Actually, if you looked at the config, it's gotten rather large. You can do a show configuration uh, count. That'll give me the number of lines. That's quite a bit more than uh, we had when we started. Yeah. This will work. This will finish. So I'm just going to go ahead and wrap the video here. And uh, thanks for watching. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly or drop them in the comment section below and I'll answer them all. Have a great day. Again, thanks for joining me. Next two videos are going to be pretty fun.